seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Now we'll get on to some information about things. The traditional location for the Mount of the Beatitudes is said to be on the northwestern shore of the Sea of Galilee, between Capernaum and Gemerset, on the southern slopes of the Chorazin Plateau. The actual location of the Sermon on the Mount is not certain, but the present site is known as Mount Eremos, has been commemorated for 1,600 years. What we need to realize is Jesus is talking directly to his disciples when he's giving the Beatitudes. Beatitude means blessings, blessed, or happy. Teachers at that time would sit to teach and the students would stand. Teachers at that time would stand to herald or proclaim a truth. When a Jewish rabbi was teaching officially, he sat to teach. Often a rabbi gave instruction when he was standing or strolling about, but his real official teaching was done when he had taken his seat. So then the very intimation that Jesus sat down to teach his disciples is the indication that this teaching is central and official. The Beatitudes can be taken as the way Jesus wants us to live or what we should try to live up to as a disciple. Jesus wants us to have all the characteristics listed in these verses in our lives. There are at least four ways to understand the Beatitudes. First, they are a code of ethics for the disciples and a standard of conduct for all believers. Second, they contrast kingdom values, things that are eternal, with worldly values, things that are temporary. Third, they contrast the superficial faith of the Pharisees with the real faith Christ wants us to have. Lastly, they show how the Old Testament expectations will be fulfilled in the new kingdom. These beatitudes are not multiple choice. They must be taken as a whole. They describe what we should be like as followers of Christ. Verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Those who are poor in spirit recognize they are spiritually bankrupt. They recognize they have nothing they can offer the Lord. Poor in spirit is the opposite of proud. Poor in spirit is a confession we are sinful. When we look at ourselves in the light of Jesus, we should recognize how sinful we are. The poor in spirit are rewarded because they receive the kingdom of heaven. Peter realized he was poor in spirit when he said to Jesus in Luke chapter 5, verse 8, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Another opposite of being poor in spirit is to have personal independence, where someone feels they don't need God or we can get to heaven on our own merit. James 4, verses 7 through 10, tells us how to develop the attitude of being poor in spirit. It says, Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. Where verse 7 talks about cleansing your hands and purifying your hearts, it's basically saying lead a pure life. Verse 9 is saying don't be afraid to express deep heartfelt sorrow for your sin. Now uh, on to verse 4. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. We see in Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1 and 2, the anticipation of Matthew chapter 5, verse 4. Verse 1 and 2 read, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. Our reward to those who mourn is God will comfort us. 2 Corinthians 1 verses 3 and 4 says that our God is the God of all comfort who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Many think that when God comforts us, in our, tr our trouble should go away. But if that were always so, people would turn to God only out of desire to be relieved of pain and not out of love for Him. We must understand that being comforted can also mean receiving strength, 
encouragement, and hope to deal with our troubles. The more we suffer, the more comfort God gives us. Remember that every trial you endure will help you comfort others who are suffering similar troubles. Lastly, verses that go along with Matthew 5, 4 is James 4, verses 9 and 10. It says, Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. Verse 5, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. The word meek comes from the Greek translation of the word praus. The word is actually a translation from the Greek military term used for horses trained for battle. Wild stallions were brought down from the mountains and broken for riding. Some were used to pull wagons, some were raced, and the best were trained for warfare. They retained their fierce spirit, courage, and powder, power, but were disciplined to respond to the slightest nudge or pressure of the rider's leg. They could gallop into battle at 35 miles per hour and come to a sliding stop at a word. They were not frightened by arrows, spears, or torches. Then they were said to be meeked. To be meeked was to be taken from a state of wild rebellion and made completely loyal to and depend on one's master. It is also taken from an atmosphere of fearfulness and made unflinching in the presence of danger. Some war horses dove from ravines into rivers in pursuit of their quarry. Some charged into the face of exploding cannons. These stallions became submissive but were certainly not spineless. They embodied power under control, strength with forbearance. When Paul speaks of the meekness and gentleness of Christ, he described this kind of obedience. Jesus did not suffer on the cross because he was a doormat. He went to pay a price that had to be paid for all of us, including you and me. He willingly gave his life for us. We too are called to demonstrate power under control. Through the Holy Spirit, we can forgive those who hurt us. We can hold our tongue when someone insults us. Even though we would really like to bite their head off, we can be the first to apologize. We can be a servant to others. We can be meek. Now, the second part of that verse that says the reward of being meek is that you inherit the earth. If you think about what the earth has become, that statement doesn't sound so great. But the earth will be made new and restored how it was originally. We will reign with the Lord there a thousand years. Now, that sounds more like it. There's nothing we can do to this earth that the Lord can't undo. Psalm, verse, Psalm 37, verses 5 through 11, shows the anticipation of this teaching. It says, Commit your way to the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth your righteousness as the light, and your justice as noonday. Rest in the Lord, and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of man who brings wicked schemes to pass. Do not fret, it only causes harm. For evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait on the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall be no more. Indeed, you will look carefully for his place, but it shall be no more. But the meek shall inherit the earth, and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. <clears throat> Verse 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. What is righteousness? The Greek New Testament word for righteousness primarily describes conduct in relation to others, especially in regards to the rights of others in business, in legal matters, and beginning with relationship to God. <clears throat> it is contrasted with wickedness, the conduct of the one who out of gross self-centeredness neither reveres God nor respects man. The Bible describes the righteous person as just or right, holding to God and trusting in him. The second part of that verse says you'll be filled, or in other words, satisfied. Unfortunately, I don't feel that we will truly reach the point of being completely filled or satisfied this side of eternity. Verse 7, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. We can see Old Testament anticipation for this verse in Psalm 41, verse 1. Blessed is he who considers the poor. The Lord will deliver him in time of trouble. God's word often speaks of God's care for the weak, poor, and needy, and of his blessings on those who share his concern. God wants our generosity to reflect his own free giving. As he has blessed us, we should bless others. So yes, 
Sometimes meeting a need in someone's life is showing them mercy if you have the means to meet that need. How do we develop this attitude? Ephesians 5 verses 1 and 2 says, Therefore be imitators of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. Verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. We can see Old Testament anticipation for this verse in Psalms 51.10. It says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. The thought behind this verse is of straightness and honesty. These are the people not given to the world's little stains. The pure of heart receive the most wonderful reward. They get to see God. They will experience greater intimacy with God than they could have possibly imagined. This intimate relationship should be our greatest motivation for purity. We must be the people who are merciful and pure in heart. You have heard it said, what comes out of your mouth comes straight from your heart. This is especially true in times of anger. I am guilty of this. When we fill our lives with garbage and carry the garbage around with us, the saying goes, garbage in and garbage out. We need to be filling our lives daily with the things of God and not the trash of this world. And by trash, I'm talking social media, trashy shows on TV, and politics. We spend more time on our electronic devices than we do communicating with our families. If we spent half the time most of us spend on our phones, in God's Word, or talking to the Lord, imagine the relationship we could have with the Lord. And I'm not going to go into my reasons for not liking social media, because I'm sure most of you already know and have seen it firsthand. But I will say politics leaves people angry and bitter. It takes our focus off God. It puts people at odds with each other. We put our hope in people to change the the things instead of putting that hope in God, in our God, who always is in control. Let us be pure in heart. Let us focus, let our focus be tunnel vision on the Lord, and let our hearts be focused on his glory. Verse 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. We see Old Testament anticipation for this verse in Isaiah 57, verse 18 and 19. It says, I have seen his ways and will heal him. I will also lead him and restore comforts to him and to his mourners. I create the fruit of the lips, peace, peace to him who is far off and to him is near, says the Lord, and I will heal him. Isaiah 60 verse 17 says, instead of bronze, I will bring gold. Instead of iron, I will bring silver. Instead of wood, bronze. And instead of stones, iron. I will also make your offices peace and your magistrates righteousness. Romans 12, verse 19 through 21, shows us how to develop this attitude. Romans 12, 19 through 21 says, Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place for wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in doing so, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Matthew 5, 9 is not talking about those who live in peace, but those who bring about peace. How do we, how do we overcome evil with good? We can do it by doing what we are called to do, which is sharing go- the gospel with others. Each person who hears the gospel and accepts Christ removes that much more evil or evil intent in the world. Those who accept the gospel and receive Christ will want to tell others, and hopefully there will be a domino effect overcoming evil. Verse 10. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Old Testament anticipation for this verse can be found in Isaiah 52, verse 13. It says, Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. The servant, as the term used here, is the Messiah or the Lord Jesus. He would be highly exalted because of his sacrifice described in Isaiah chapter 53. More Old Testament anticipation is found in Isaiah 53 verse 12. It says, Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. 
We can develop the attitude for this verse by reading 2 Timothy 3, verse 12. It says, Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. I would say that's pretty much a guarantee. In this verse, Paul is telling Timothy that people who obey God and live for Christ will be persecuted. Don't be surprised when people misunderstand, criticize, and even try to hurt you because of what you believe and how you live. Don't give up. God is the only one you need to please. Verse 11 and 12. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for your name's sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Jesus said to rejoice when we are persecuted. Persecution can be good, for first of all, it takes our eyes off of earthly rewards. Secondly, it strips away our superficial belief. Third, it strengthens the faith of those who endure it. And fourth, our attitude through it serves as an example to others who follow. We can be comforted to know that God's greatest prophets were persecuted. Elijah, Jeremiah, Daniel. The fact that we are being persecuted proves that we've been faithful. Faithless people would go unnoticed. In the future, God will reward the faithful by receiving them into his eternal kingdom where there's no more persecution. More verses that go along with, with uh, verse 12 is 2 Chronicles 36, 16, Matthew 23, 37, and Acts 7, 52. So in 2 Chronicles 36, 16, it says, But they mocked the messengers of God, despised his words, and scoffed at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord rose against his people till there was no remedy. Matthew 23, 37, Jesus says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who sent by her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Acts 7, verse 52 says, Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one, of whom you now have become betrayers and murderers. On to verse 13. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. Back in the days when this verse was written, there was no refrigeration. Salt was used as a preservative. When meat was butchered, it soon would putrefy because of the surface bacteria. Salt kills the bacteria and prevents rapid putrefaction. The second use was for flavoring, bringing out or enhancing the flavor of food. Who likes salt on their McDonald's french fries? Now imagine them without the salt. They would no longer be something desired by most people. It is said Jesus had both uses in mind when he said, You are the salt of the earth. We were to have a preserving effect on people. By sharing the gospel with them and being a godly example to people, we have a preserving effect on our communities and on people's souls through faith in Christ Jesus. We are not to be like the world. We are called to be different. We are, we are not to be a seasoning that blends in. We are to stand out and affect others positively, just as seasoning brings out the flavor of food. Lastly, as salty popcorn and salty peanuts makes us thirsty, our lives should cause other people to, to thirst for a true relationship with Christ Jesus. Verses 14, 15, and 16. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all those who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they have seen your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Can you hide a city on a hill? Its lights can be seen for miles. If we live for Christ, we can glow like lights, showing others what Christ is like. We hide our light by first of all, being quiet when we should speak. You feel the Holy Spirit prompting you to speak and to tell the person you've come across, yet you keep quiet, afraid of what that person might think. Secondly, when we go along with the crowd, an example of this is when you go with a group of friends to a movie, and that movie has scenes that are not fitting for a Christian. And again, the Holy Spirit's prompting you to get up and walk out of the the theater, but you don't because you're afraid of what your friends might say or think. You're hiding your light. Third, denying the light. Fourth, letting sin dim your light. Casting Crowns has a song called Slow Fade. 
The song describes sin causing the light of our Christian walk to slowly fade. The song says it doesn't happen in a day, but a little sin makes it easier for more, and soon your light is dim and your walk is turned to a crawl. Fifth, not explaining our light to others. 1 Peter 3, verse 15 says, But sanctify the Lord in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness, there's that word again, and fear. Lastly, ignoring the needs of others hides the light in us. When you see a true need in someone's life, it's an opportunity to meet that need and share your light and Christ's love with someone to encourage them to invite them to church. I'm not talking, however, of enabling people and allowing them to stay in a situation that's not good for them. Verse 17 and 18. Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, the, but to fulfill. For assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth has passed away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass away from the law till it all is fulfilled. God's moral and ceremonial laws were given to help people love God with all their hearts and minds. Throughout Israel's history, however, these laws have been often misquoted and misapplied. By Jesus' time, religious leaders had turned the laws into a confusing mass of rules. When Jesus talked about a new way to understand God's law, he was actually trying to bring people back to its original purpose. Jesus did not speak against the law itself, but against the abuses and excesses to which it was subjected. John 1, verse 17 says, For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Christ Jesus. Law and grace are both aspects of God's nature that he uses in dealing with us. Moses emphasized God's law and justice. While Jesus came to highlight God's mercy, love, and forgiveness, Moses could only be the giver of the law, while Christ came to fulfill the law. Now in verse 18, a jot is the smallest letter in the Hebrew alphabet, and a tittle was the smallest part of a letter you could make. It would be like putting a dot on a lowercase i. If Jesus did not come to destroy the law, does that mean all Old Testament laws still apply to us today? In, Old Test in the Old Testament, there were three categories of law, ceremonial, civil, and moral. The ceremonial law related specifically to Israel's worship. Its primary purpose was to point towards Jesus. We see an example of this in Leviticus 1, verses 2 and 3. It says, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When any of you brings an offering to the Lord, you shall bring your offering of the livestock, of the herd, and of the flock. If his offering is a burnt sacrifice of the herd, let him offer a male without blemish. He shall offer it of his own free will at the door of the tabernacle of meeting before the Lord. These sacrifices were done as an atonement or covering for sins, and we know later that Jesus became the perfect sacrifice and only sacrifice that not only just covered our sins, but paid for them all. The laws are no longer necessary after Jesus' death and resurrection. While we are no longer bound by ceremonial laws, the principles behind them to worship and love a holy God still apply. Jesus was often accused by the Pharisees of violating ceremonial law. Now the civil law, civil law applied to daily living in Israel. We'll look at Deuteronomy 24, verse 10 and 11 for an example. 24.10 says, When you lend your brother, you shall not go into his house to get his pledge. You shall stand outside, and the man to whom you lend shall bring the pledge out to you. A pledge in this case is collateral or something of value. Because modern society and culture are so radically different from that time and setting, all these guidelines cannot be followed specifically, but the principles behind the commands are timeless and should guide our conduct. Jesus demonstrated these principles by example. Moving on. The moral law, such as the Ten Commandments, is a direct command of God, and it requires strict obedience. For example, Exodus 20, verse 13 says, You shall not murder. The moral law reveals the nature and will of God, and it still applies today. Jesus obeyed the moral law completely. Verse 19. Whoever therefore breaks the least of these commands and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. 
A lot of people who heard Jesus teach were experts at telling others what to do, but they missed the central point of God's laws themselves. Jesus made it clear, however, that obeying God's law is more important than explaining it. It's much easier to study God's laws and tell other people to obey them than to put them into practice ourselves. Verse 20. For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. The Pharisees were exacting and scrupulous in their attempts to follow the laws. So how could Jesus reasonably call us to a greater righteousness than theirs? The Pharisees' weakness was that they were content to obey the laws outwardly without allowing God to change their hearts or attitudes. Jesus was saying, therefore, that the quality of our, of our goodness should be greater than that of the Pharisees. They looked pious, but they were far from the kingdom of God. God judges our hearts as well as our works, for it's in the heart that our real allegiance lies. Be just as concerned about your attitudes that people don't see as your actions seen by all. Jesus was basically saying that his listeners needed a different kind of righteousness altogether, which is love and obedience, not just more intense version of the Pharisees' righteousness that is legal compliance. Our righteousness must come from what God does in us, not what we can do for ourselves. Second, we must be God-centered, not self-centered. Third, our righteousness needs to be based on reverence for God, not approval from people. And lastly, our righteousness needs to go beyond keeping the law to living by the principles behind the law. Romans 10 verse 3 says, For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness have not submitted to the righteousness of God. Rather than living by faith in God, the Jews established customs and traditions in addition to God's law to try to make themselves acceptable in God's sight. But human effort, no matter how sincere, can never be a substitute for the righteousness God offers us by faith. The only way to earn salvation is to be perfect, and that's impossible. But we can hold out our empty hands and receive salvation as a gift. Verse 21 and 22. You've heard it said that to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Reka, shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says, You fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. When Jesus said, But I say to you, he was not doing away with the law in addition to his own beliefs, or adding to his own beliefs, I'm sorry. Rather, he was giving a fuller understanding of why God made the law in the first place. For example, it says again in Exodus 20.13, You shall not murder. Jesus taught that we should not even become angry enough to murder, for then we have already committed murder in our heart. The Pharisees read this law, and not having literally murdered anyone, felt righteous. Yet they were angry enough with Jesus that they would soon plot his death, though they would not do the dirty work themselves. We miss the intent of God's word, when we read his rules for living without trying to understand why he made them. Killing is a terrible sin, but anger is a great sin too, because it also violates God's command to love. Anger in this case refers to a soothing, a seething, brooding bitterness against someone. It's a dangerous emotion that always threatens to leap out of control. Like being emotionally intoxicated, it leads to violence, emotional hurt, increased mental stress, and spiritual damage. Anger keeps us from developing a spirit pleasing to God. Having self-control is good, but Christ wants us to practice thought control as well. Going back into verse 22 where it says, Whoever says to his brother, Reka, shall be in danger of the council. Reka comes from an Aramaic word which literally means empty one, but probably meant empty-headed or foolish. Another translation says vain, empty, or worthless. Hopefully, the teaching tonight has given everyone something to think about. Let's pray. We thank you, Lord, for tonight, Lord, and we just ask you would uh, bless everyone with a safe trip home, Lord, and uh, we thank you for providing. In Jesus' name, amen.